Union Bank is proud to support Lost LA. Los Angeles makes the moving images that entrance America and the world. But who gets to do that work? Who chooses those powerful images? This time on Lost LA, let's sneak through the studio gates for a few untold stories from inside the Hollywood Dream Factory. I'm Nathan Masters, and this is Lost LA. Many people see LA as a city of the future, a place without a past, a freeway metropolis that sprang up fully formed in the 20th century. But the roots of Southern California history run deep. People have called this land home for thousands of years, and their stories give us a richer understanding of where we are now and where we're headed in the decades to come. So let's look back and uncover some of these forgotten stories in the archives. Lost LA explores Southern California history by bringing archival materials to life. The early film industry was a creative wild west, open to anyone with the resources or boldness to exploit the new technology of motion pictures. For a time that included the female producers, directors, and writers who seized some of the industry's top creative positions, but that didn't last long. Let's investigate what changed the roles of women in Hollywood. When movies began to be popular, they weren't necessarily associated with respectability. Um, movies at the beginning of the 20th century were a kind of cheap entertainment uh, associated with urban, working class, immigrant audiences. A lot of the early workers in the film industry are coming out of a theatrical background. Mostly, you know, the early directors, actors, producers, whatnot, are coming out of a theater background. And the theater, over the course of the 19th century, had actually been a place where women had, more than perhaps any other industry, been allowed to take on unusual roles. As movies became more popular in the 1910s, the industry was very invested in earning a kind of cultural legitimacy and earning a kind of respectability. And so one of the ways they did this was to court more female viewers. Part of the film industry's investment in addressing itself so much to a female audience is that they are actively involved in the 1910s in trying to attract more women into the audience because they want to raise its reputation. And you see the film industry sort of taking that up a little bit in this fan literature and its willingness to depict itself as the industry for ambitious young women to sort of make their mark. And they say this quite directly, you know, in that contest, you know, do you want to be the next screenwriter? Do you want to be the, it's not just do you want to be the next star, it's for all these different roles. So somebody like Lois Weber, working on the other side of the camera as a married white middle class woman, brought a kind of respectability to that side of the camera as well, brought a respectability to that side of the industry. It's amazing to me that Weber is not very well known. So many people say to me, how could I never have heard of her? And it really is amazing that someone who was the first woman accepted to the Motion Picture Directors Association, precursor of the Directors Guild, who was mayor of Universal City, who was on the first directors committee at the Academy, who was one of the highest paid directors in Hollywood, who was one of the first directors to form their own production company, that nobody knows about her. I mean, it's just astonishing to me. Weber was considered one of the three great minds in early Hollywood alongside D.W. Griffith and Cecil B. DeMille. Uh, everybody remembers Griffith and DeMille as the fathers of American cinema. Like Griffith and DeMille, she was very invested in demonstrating the sophistication of this new art form and ensuring its cultural legitimacy. Weber makes a film in 1913 called Suspense, where she plays a woman who is uh, alone with her baby in a villa besieged by attackers. And suspense is so ahead of its time in terms of cinematography and shock composition and camera work. It's an astonishing film. Part of this is like sort of sex stereotyping in a, sen in a sense, because they did firmly believe women could tell stories for women better. 
And so if you wanted women in the theater, then you needed to have them coming up with the stories about women's lives. Weber was a really commanding director. She said that the director has to have absolute authority. Uh, and I think the fact that she was both a screenwriter and a director, that she was directing her own scripts, I mean, she had a, a complete vision for her work. For instance, Shoes, her film about urban poverty, is told through the story of a young shop girl whose wages are supporting her entire family. Her father's unemployed, she's supporting her entire family. That emotional experience of poverty, we understand through her and through specifically cinematic devices that uh, where we see inside her mind, we see her optical point of view, we understand her feelings. It's not just visual storytelling, it's the kind of identification that audiences can have with fictional characters on screen that cinematic language enables. Weber cultivated a persona of a matronly, white, middle-class, married woman. So it wasn't just that she was a woman, it was that she was a particular kind of woman. And that allowed her to take on these really controversial subjects. Universal's top film in 1916 was a film on abortion and birth control, written and directed by a woman who was that studio's top director. And critics at the time are recognizing that. They'll say, she's a filmmaker who's willing to take on topics that others dare not touch. And others will often say that it's her, her persona, but I also think it's her gender, that allows her to take on those issues. She is then very clearly Universal's top director. She's the top director in 1916 and 1917, and she's making extraordinarily popular and profitable films for them. All of the kind of shifts in her career, the kind of key moments when she shifts, have to do with her wanting more artistic control and wanting to do more. She leaves Universal in the summer of 1917 to form Lois Weber production. So she leaves Universal at the height of her power. And because of her power, she's able to negotiate a really lucrative distribution deal with Universal. Then she switches and gets an even more lucrative distribution deal with Paramount. At Lois Weber Productions, she makes 14 films in four years. She writes and directs 14 feature films in four years, which is extraordinary. By 1920, you have a Republican president and you have a Republican in control of both houses of Congress, which had not been the case ever. Suffrage passes in 1920, and it seems like things are moving really fast all of a sudden in terms of gender roles. There is a broader backlash in the culture against that. And suddenly, it isn't so great for the movie industry to be known as a place that's so attractive to women and is supporting women's progress and supporting women doing unconventional things. And there is brewing concern by 1919, 1920, that the federal government is going to step in and regulate motion picture film content the way that they regulated liquor. The code sets up high standards of performance for motion picture producers. You want entertainment, wholesome, interesting, and vital. The main thing that starts to happen in the 1920s that shifts the role of women is that the industry is starting to consolidate. As independent as she is, it's all about those distribution deals. Paramount ultimately uh, revokes her contract. She makes a film called What Do Men Want in 1921 at Lois Weber Productions. She was summoned to Paramount offices in corporate headquarters in New York, and they told her, we can't distribute this under the Paramount banner, and dissolved her contract. And then it became very difficult for her, her production company to, to survive.
when Weber's production company collapses in 1921, it's a real kind of watershed moment in Hollywood history. It's a moment when uh, a lot of major studios are consolidating power. Studios whose names still dominate our entertainment landscape today, right, are, are starting to consolidate power and they're buying up theater chains. And they're making it very, very hard for independent production companies to survive. And so Lois Weber is part of a whole generation of independent filmmakers that find it increasingly difficult to get their films distributed in the 20s. So there's, there's other women, there's our African-American filmmakers who suddenly find it very difficult to um, get distribution contracts. As Hollywood becomes essentially another corporate entity and people realize that this is a big business that's going to be around and that there's a lot of money involved and that that's going to remain true for a long time, the attitudes, the more flexible attitudes towards who does what start to change. This is the re-masculinization of the industry. And there is at that point a very clear erasure of, fem of the work of female filmmakers in early Hollywood. And Weber was not alone. There were hundreds of women directing in Hollywood, early Hollywood. And yet, the early histories of Hollywood only talk about female stars. They don't talk about the power of female screenwriters. They don't talk about female filmmakers. So this erasure happens, didn't happen recently. It happened early. It happened before Weber was even over her career, let alone before she even died. That, that kind of myth of the history of Hollywood as a, as a male industry was, was put in place pretty early. But I do think that forgetting that history, forgetting how crucial women were to early filmmaking, has continued to hamper female filmmakers for generations because there's this sense that no, no women have ever made films before. Oh, could, could women ever direct action films? Well, they did 100 years ago. Can women ever make popular, profitable films? Oh, I, I don't know. You know, they did 100 years ago. So the, this forgetting has had monumental consequences and, and has carried enormous weight for almost 100 years now. As early Hollywood began setting its movies in exotic locales, it needed diverse actors to make them look authentic. To find them, the studios turned toward the city's multi-ethnic population and set up a central casting bureau to exploit it. Charlie Chan was played by Sid Toler, Caucasian actor. I think we go to hospital. Because the studios wanted to make money. And uh, if they chose Chinese to play uh, Charlie Chan, I doubt if very many uh, moviegoers uh, would go see it on the movie screen. Opinion like tea leaf in hot water. Both need time for brewing. <laughs> He's terrific. <laughs> but those were the sign of the times. One of the reasons that the film industry had settled in Los Angeles was because of its, you know, sheer topographical diversity. You can pretty much imitate any place in the world that you want within a four or five hour trip from Los Angeles at most. In the 20s and 30s, Americans have had a bit of a geography lesson after World War I, and so that opens up people's cultural imagination to faraway places that didn't quite exist before. It was very popular to have these kind of exotic settings like South Pacific or Africa was a, a popular setting to set some of the more exotic films. So you're gonna have, and this would have been the terms of the day, you know, a need for a certain number of background savages is what they were called. Central Casting Bureau was formed in 1925. And it was formed under the auspices of the Hayes office. 
Will Hayes had been appointed by the industry group, the MPPDA, and there was a lot of concern in the early 20s about the misuse of extras. It's really an attempt to standardize how extras get employment and make that process safer and more fair. The Central Casting Bureau, it was hugely popular. I mean, tens of thousands of people registered for this service. During the 1930s, to make extra money, my father and I became extras. Central Casting didn't have a, a means of connecting with the Chinese community, so they did it through Tom Gubbins, uh, who spoke Cantonese and had his uh, Asiatic store there. So they would take all the Chinese uh, kids, whoever could want to work, and uh, Tom Gubbins arranged a bus in front of his store, and all of us have to report there and get on the bus, and they take us to the studio to work. We go to the studio, they interview us, and then they pick certain types, and after they pick certain types, they would push our hair, put a bandana on, put a coolie hat on. We were either coolies or peasants, or work at the laundry, or work out in the fields. We never looked pretty. We always looked, uh, I wouldn't say ugly, but we would look like peasants is what it is. A lot of the Chinese uh, uh, in Chinatown and so forth depended upon central casting for a living because being an extra earned them a lot of money. That is good and that is bad because that was good in the sense they earned a living that was bad because they were slotted into a category of being Asian American extras. And they were happy doing that. The central casting had a set of forms that you would fill out where you would describe your weight, your height, you know, your look, any special talents. Since bit parts were basically about filling the extra background. So if you can imagine if you have a Western, you're going to need to have a certain number of background players that look like Native Americans. So when you filled out these forms, you would indicate you know, how you fit into the specific types, that when a Hollywood director said, I need 40 savages for my latest African film, or I need 20 Indians for my latest Western, you would go to your lists and you would figure out who were the people that fit into those types. For the most part, it was almost impossible for people of color to have a leading role in Hollywood. In the Charlie Chan movie, I remember the director saying to me, in this hospital scene, say, this place smells too much like medicine. And I told all my friends, uh, I have a speaking part in Charlie Chan in Honolulu, but then when I went to see the movie, uh, I could see me holding my nose and shaking my head, but my speaking part was on the cutting room floor. All about. You can't play in the movies just as cliche characters. You have to play in principal roles where you are important people, citizens of America contributing to the community, but they weren't giving any credit for it. We weren't doing that extras, extras as the Ching Ching Chinaman because they were just servants and, and uh, villains and railroad workers uh, that had no rights. You know, like in Good Earth, the, the major roles went to the Caucasians. In the old days, what they do is they use Caucasian people, tape their eyes, and they play as Oriental. But it is so great, I thought it must show in my face. Market chief comes to dispute them. Sakini by name, interpreter by profession. And they put their slanted eyes like this and talk like this, you know, and it was terrible to me. That was a great insult. One of the things that Hollywood learns early on is that representing race in American films is a sure way to get into trouble. If you have a storyline that's about race, in many instances, Southern theaters will just ban it completely, so you will just not get that market at all. Say, Birth of a Nation is you know, a famous example to point to. You had a huge amount of outcry from the African-American press about the representation of African-Americans in that film. You had a huge amount of outcry from white people in America about the fact that they thought that the film was fomenting race trouble. Mammy. Mammy. 
Initially, you know, you would have white people actually blacking up to play black roles because there was so much concern about black actors touching white actresses. But after a lot of outcry, they get rid of that. And so you no longer have white people playing black roles by the 1920s. 99% of the time, the roles for non-whites were easily fulfilled by the Central Casting Bureau, which is to say that those background parts were heavily stereotyped. Can you tell me what's wrong now? You're in China now, sir, where time and life have no value. I know I'm in China. You know, the progressive parts of American culture have been more dormant in some respects reflected in the fact that maybe some of these areas there was a fair amount of change and then that amount of change, then it slowed down. You might say in the early times I was playing all stereotype parts. JJ get us to see Mr. Mulray. Yet we all keep trying like fools. <laughs> Edgar Poe Wong. They call me snotty. You not come here! Illegal! And somewhere along the line, I didn't like that, because then you believe yourself as a clichéism. What we're seeing now, in terms of the greater call for Hollywood to look at its lack of diversity, you know, the, the problem that still exists, is trying to open up that dialogue again. Um, and I think one of the lessons from the past is that for it to succeed, we're going to have to keep it up. Hollywood stands accused of having a problem with so-called whitewashing. There's so few roles for Asian actors, mm -hmm. and I, I would really hope that we would get to play ourselves, at the very least. Suki, come get Mishima! Suki, stupid cow. Hey, may I help you? We don't accept blackface in any of its forms yeah. in film or television. Why would we accept yellowface? It seems to be happening continually. Maybe next time you can design me better. It can't just be sort of a complaint here and a complaint here, that it needs to be a sustained effort. You know, social change doesn't happen easily or quickly, usually. Clearly, there's still problems with Hollywood's representation, and so, you know, if we want that to change, then we have to continue to make sure that that is an important point that's being voiced to the industry. I've been in this industry 66 years or something. That's a lot of years to make this much <laughs> progress, you know. It's just too slow, you know. In my, well, you figure, in my lifetime, went from there to here. Not very big. The Hollywood Dream Factory imagined one version of Los Angeles. Next time on Lost LA, we'll look at how two other communities created their own underground versions of the city. Lost L.A. was made possible by the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, the California State Library, and California Humanities. Union Bank is proud to support Lost L.A.